Hello, this is Jay. Welcome to my channel. Today I thought I'd go over everything that Tina and I did to plan and navigate throughout Vancouver Island. There were many sources we used. Many had, they each had their shortcomings, but using all of them kind of filled in the gaps and got us to go around. And even then, uh, some of the vlogging roads changed so often that talking to the locals we met at campsites actually filled in some of the details. So I'll go over all that with you as well as any advice and tips or places that I highly recommend that you go when you get to Vancouver Island. The first thing we did was obviously, like most nomadic people, use Google Maps, right? In the United States, it gets you almost everywhere really well, even off-roading roads. It has most of it. It's actually quite detailed and it can get you most places you need, although sometimes it will tell you that it can't navigate there. Vancouver Island, however, it was probably our least successful as far as once we got off the highways or paved areas. Once we were off, it couldn't figure out how to get to most places we were trying to get. It was not the best. And we did download all the offline maps for Vancouver Island because Google Maps shows it as rectangles, taller rectangles, you have to download portions. But I did do that and Tina did it as well. So it had everything and we did that just before crossing into Canada. But it still didn't fill in everything that we needed. Tina also used a app, it's actually free, called MapsMe. And it's a navigation map, it actually tell you turn by turn navigation and you can download entire areas to use offline. And Vancouver Island, for some reason, was only about 62 megs of download, which is really small considering how much it has. But it did have a lot of the logging roads that Google Maps did not have. And we used this. This is our atlas that we bought when we were at the ferry terminal. And this actually had a ton of roads that neither of those had, but this also did not have some things MapsMe did not have, probably because it's a couple years old, so the logging roads are constantly changing, so this was unaware of it. The big thing too, though, is, again, the logging roads do constantly change, and there was one portion heading towards Naka Creek, there was a shorter road but there was a little cutout on all our sources. It said that was closed. And British Columbia's recreation sites directions for Naka Creek also set to go a different way. So we went the other way, but we talked to locals there and they did say that the logging companies did connect the roads recently. So nothing showed that. So although all your sources are good, they might still not be perfect just because logging companies constantly adjust the roads based on their needs. So to go over quickly, MapsMe is a free navigation app. It had a lot of roads that Google Maps didn't have. It had some roads that the Atlas didn't have, but it also was missing some roads that the Atlas had. And the Atlas also has other information I'll go into in a little bit. Now there's Google Maps. I still think it's quite essential for exploring all of Vancouver Island because I don't know, if you've watched a TV show alone, you think Vancouver Island is just nothing. <laughs> and I used to think there was maybe a town there, like a big town, but the island is gigantic and there's several huge towns all along, mostly the eastern coast. And there are some smaller towns along the west, but they're real small. But the uh, like Campbell River, Nanaimo, Victoria, those are all very large towns. And you'll find anything you need there, groceries, Gas is actually reasonably priced, the same as in Vancouver. I thought it'd be a lot more, but it wasn't. Um, there's plenty of grocery stores, even at Port Renfrew, way up north, there's a grocery store there. And people did warn us that there weren't gonna be fresh products there, that maybe once a week they bring it there, but we didn't seem to have any problems when we went there. Maybe we got lucky, who knows. Google Maps though, it is very useful just because you can keep track of all the companies. You can find out all your hotel rooms um, that you can stay in, laundromats, grocery stores, the hours, all that. So of course you need that. So make sure you download all those for offline use before you get on an island 
or once you're in the city areas because once you head towards western area cell service is very limited <laughs> we've had days with no cell service even while driving so just be aware of that and i did use verizon and tina used an at&t provider but i had a little more service than her but still hardly anything once you go west another product we use for navigation is this map it's just one of these folding maps they're laminated so it kind of gets protected when it rains and when you go on vancouver island in september it's gonna rain now it's got most of the city zoomed in um, and the vancouver island itself zoomed out it's just kind of like it's a quick reference to where all the big items are um, we didn't really use this as often because the atlas did have the full map as well and with that you can actually get closer in images of everything so i wouldn't recommend recommend this exactly but it's not bad because it's laminated and protected now this last source we use for navigation is the only one that isn't well besides the other map it's not free this here is the vancouver island british columbia victoria and gulf islands book it's $26 Canadian, so about $20 US, a little less. So it will cost you money. Yes, Google Maps and Maps Me are free, and that'll get you around. But this actually has some great features. If you want to just stay in the city areas, those are just fine. Perfect. If you want to stay just a little off the city areas, those are fine as well. Be aware, there are a lot of rec sites, recreation sites on the island but we talked to some hosts at a one recreation site and she did clarify for us definitely that the most popular and easy to get to ones are pay sites whereas the ones much further away are all generally are free so if you want to get to a free rec site you're going to have to do get off the road for quite a while or off the highways for quite a while places like naka creek and elk bay they were free but you did have to drive on gravel roads for quite a while it wasn't super rough and the roads weren't in bad condition they were really wide but you did have to drive on those we did notice some of the ones like right off the highway you may have to pay for so those places you could probably get away with google maps but for other places you may want to definitely look into this the strength of this is on the back, there's a map of the entire island and they it's in a grid and they're all numbered. And if you want to zoom into any one, say, so let's go into 48. That is where Naka Creek is at, one of the best sites we were at before. And if you flip over to page 48, you'll see Naka Creek and you'll see a bunch of roads. And you'll see actually that a lot of the roads are different thicknesses. There is a legend in the beginning that shows the quality of the roads or the type of roads based on the color as well as thickness of the roads. So if you see dark black, that would be a gravel road, but it's maintained. And you'll see some of the roads are actually thinner black. And those are not as well maintained. And the real thin ones that look like little caterpillars everywhere, those are for 4x4 four four only. We didn't go on any of those because we didn't need to go on any of them because we didn't have to they seem like just offshoots but some of the roads that are just like a medium thickness they were pretty rough so be aware of that they have some extreme not extreme but higher elevation gain than you would think so towing an rv would probably not be the best option at some of those but the darker black seems to be fine and down at the bottom end of page 48, you'll see the road that goes from Naka Creek and there's that gap there that was filled in going to the main road. As well as maps like that, there are pages in here with recreation sites as well as trails and there are fishing resources in here as, far, as well as canoeing resources and kayaking resources. There's a lot more in here that we didn't use. We mostly just looked at the maps and the recreation sites and trails. The recreation site portion is really nice. It lists them all out and it has little grid numbers of where the 
recreation sites are as far as like page number on the map corresponds with the grid and it has little icons there showing you what features they have there like boating or if it's a fee recreation site so it's, if you want to stay cheaper you try to find the ones without the fee of course and there are a lot of things they'll say like pit toilet table fire pit things like that and it also shows you if you can go fishing or kayaking there because there's a boating ramp um, we didn't have one so it didn't matter to us there are many recreation sites that you can only get to by boat and it'll show that as well because you don't want to try to plan that and even if you try to plan it when you look at it on a map you'll see that there are no roads going to it and uh, those are true there are no roads going to them so don't try to go to those that would be bad so for the ferry ride we went from Sawasan we reserved a spot because we had read online that they can become full and when I went to reserve previous days a lot of them were full so I do highly recommend reserving it especially if you have something reserved for that night like we had an Airbnb reserved for that night so we didn't want to miss the ferry ride and not make it so it's a few dollars more to reserve it but it's definitely worth it especially if you have other things scheduled out and it's not much there are gas stations at least in Sawasan there was a gas station right before the ferry area uh, we've noticed that the gas prices are much higher than other places in Vancouver that we drove past but there is no need to go there I think they take advantage of tourists who think that the gas prices on the island are going to be more just because it's an island but we found out that the gas prices on the island were better than that gas station right out of Sawasan so you don't have to fill up before getting on the ferry in fact even if you do you're still going to have to fill up later but the gas stations throughout the island are just fine now along the east coast there are majority of the bigger cities are on the east coast and Victoria being on the very south and then some people say Campbell River is the northernmost city but there is a Port Hardy on just north of there and we found that Port Hardy still had all the resources that we needed um, we don't need much so it does have a grocery store it got us everything we needed and it was fine so you could try that if you are worried about it though you can go to Campbell River on the way north and there are couple of big grocery stores as well as a laundromat there so you could stay there and then head up from there one thing if you're driving along the coast is there's a main highway and oftentimes there will be a scenic road which goes closer to the water sometimes it's going to be a lot slower sometimes you'll have to slow down a lot more because it drives through the towns but you kind of get a better view of the bays and the straits that are on the right side of the island so I kind of highly recommend that if you do, aren't in a hurry if you are in a hurry uh, take the highway because <laughs> the line island is a lot bigger than you may have thought before you start playing now a few tips about the recreation sites all the ones we went to even the free ones they did have pit toilets but they were some were not in the best shape and some had toilet paper so like everything else just bring toilet paper with you have hand sanitizer although this day and age hand sanitizer is super hard to get hopefully you can find some grab a bunch if you see any because uh, you'll go through it quite a bit and then most of the ones we went to actually all the recreation sites we went to did have tables as well as fire pits and as well as a pit toilet so that's pretty much all you really need a place to park table you don't need any of that really <laughs> but it's all there be aware that some of the recreation sites especially inland are harder to get to there were some spots we went to where the dirt was pretty worn out and it may have had trouble going through on the sedan we were there with my forerunner and there was another woman there with a Subaru so likely she could maneuver through but if you are towing something it would have been really tough always look at the recreation site information at the website and it'll kind of tell you what's recommended as far as like don't bring a fifth wheel with you here because you won't be able to turn around in some spots 
One big bit of advice for recreation sites is if you are there as a tourist and you're not, weekends don't modify your schedules at all, try not to go to a free good rec site near any big cities on a weekend because likely Friday after work, there are going to be people that go up to there. They know how to get there and they know about them. And after work, they, they'll try to get there. But the problem is often at the good spots, from my experience traveling around the United States, if it's a good spot and it's a weekend, it's going to be full. There's going to be people there. If it's a good spot and it's a weekday and it's after five, the chances are good that it's going to be all taken as well. If it's a weekday and it's before noon, the chances are some people are still there from their previous night, but they may be leaving, but not as many people are going to be freshly in there. Places like Naka Creek, we knew we were going to be taken because it was right on the water and there were only, I believe, seven sites. I'll have to look it up later and put it here. But there we got around, we got there early afternoon, but there were some open grass areas. So if it's all, all the campsites are full, you can kind of stay in the grass areas, they said. And that was possible, but we wanted a campsite. But we kind of got a campsite that was good, but it wasn't perfect. So we stayed there overnight the first night. And the second night we saw that a couple that had a campsite with a really nice view were packing up. So we watched them and as soon as they left, <laughs> we had everything already packed. I just drove over there and we claimed that site. So we stayed there for another two nights at that beautiful spot with trees where we could hang a hammock and right on the water. So that worked out really well. So again, free sites, try to go around noon, maybe a little 11 or so because people that stay there the night before are about to leave and you want to snag it as they leave. When we got there early afternoon, by late afternoon, a lot more cars are coming in. People with RVs for boating. It looked like some parties were joining other cars so it didn't get crowded but there were definitely a lot of people there if you got there later in the day it would have been harder to get a site away from people just to kind of have your quiet of course the other tip about recreation sites is if it's bad weather people are less likely going to be there if it's in the middle of summer yes people are more likely to be there we were there in september so when we got to elk bay uh, we were a little worried that it might be taken because it was another beautiful right on the water site, but it was raining the day before and it was supposed to rain for the next three days. So when we got there, there was one other person there and there were a ton of sites and we just kind of drove through looking for the best spot where we could also hang an extra tarp. So we wanted trees nearby and, uh, that worked out really well. So that's part of the reason I like going adventuring when the weather is bad, there's less people and you can kind of pick your spots. That way you get the campground you want. Another planning resource that we used was the British Columbia Recreation Sites website. They actually have a really nice listing. They break it up in the north and south, but they kind of include onshore mainland as well. So it kind of throws off the recreation site numbers, but they have a nice website. You click on it and it has all the recreation sites organized by area and what you do is just click on the recreation site and it'll show you some pictures as well as how many campsites they have the features amenities there and it'll show you a rough direction of how to get there now those are not updated that often so likely they will work for us every time they did work but they were not the best way to get there so it may be a good guide, but not the absolute definite way to get to those sites. These websites are of course only available when you're online. So what I did was on my phone, I installed an app called simply offline browser. So you give it a URL and then you give it a bunch of settings. And one of them is called max depth to go into. So if you put it to one off that URL, it'll download for offline use one link ahead so that's all you need for what i did if you accidentally forget it to change it to one and you have it at say two or three it'll go into that first link and every link in there it'll download all that too so your potential offline download cache could be orders bigger than 
what you really wanted. If you just keep it at one, it keeps it minimal, so it's not too bad. I did download all the pictures as well, so I could look at all the pictures and we could decide off those, whether we want to go to those rec sites. And I thought we would need it more often than not, because uh, it was really helpful because it told you how many campsites were, whereas the Atlas did not. So that helped and the pictures kind of gave us an idea of whether we want to go or not. And we did use it a few times, but not as often as we like. But it is definitely nice having the resource there because once we were in town or where we stayed at a hotel for a while, we did check the websites. So having that available for offline use would be really useful, especially if you're at a campsite and you're planning for your next few days, you can click on it and read about other recreation sites. One big thing I should tell you is in October, the island does require snow tires. So I figure until I get snow tires, like uh, better terrain tires, I will definitely not be heading up to Vancouver in October. And October would be really fun to watch too as well because uh, supposedly the salmon runs up the streams. And in September, I guess they were kind of out in the oceans and that's what draws the orcas in as well. So September was a good time to go look for orcas. And we did get quite lucky seeing like big groups of river otters fishing as well. And, lots of seals and sea lions and we kind of kept wondering about the sea lions because there were orcas swimming right outside but anyway so one thing about vancouver island i wished while we were especially at naka creek in lpa was i wished i had a kayak we stayed at some lakes as well and the water was just beautiful if you can kayak out there it'd been awesome so if you have a kayak i highly recommend bringing it with you just be aware that the kayak will increase, if you have it on the top of your car, it'll increase your maximum height of your car and you may have to go into the taller bay at the ferry, which will cost more. But there are several companies out there that make folding kayaks. And although like the Oru kayak is super expensive, um, I heard some mixed reviews about that. So I actually joined the Tuck Tech Kickstarter, which is another folding kayak. Um, not like a super fancy one, but I hope to get that soon. And maybe if I can get away this year, I'll, I'd love to go kayak around water, some lake somewhere. I don't know. But, uh, if you are going to Vancouver Island, I recommend trying out a kayak. Um, again, though, be careful because the, like off Naka Creek, it is a straight and there are huge, massive ships driving through there. So they will create huge waves. So watch out, it is pretty much the ocean. And it's funny, there are signs out there that says if you see an orca nearby to go away. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Another thing to note as well is before I went into Canada, I looked up whether I had to enable roaming or how much roaming would cost on my Verizon plan. And it turns out at some point, I guess T-Mobile decided to give free roaming for Americans into Canada and Mexico. So Verizon decided to do that as well. I'll have to look up whether AT&T followed suit as well, but usually when two of the competition does something, the third will also do it. But uh, I'll give a little note here if they did. Now, it's nice because then you don't have to worry about the roaming, so less worries for you. Another thing to note is that the southern half of Vancouver Island has all, almost no regular rec sites but has no free rec sites at all so if you're going to have to pay for a campsite it's almost worth it to just go to some of the national park or the actual um, provincial park established campsites they cost more than a rec site would but they're a lot closer to key beaches and sightseeing opportunities so you won't have to drive so much every time the first nights we were there we went to pacific rim national park and stayed at green point campground and there, it actually costs about $11 Canadian to reserve the site online. And we did reserve it online because we wanted to make sure we had it when we needed it. But also it was $33 per night Canadian. That comes to about $23 US, but still quite a bit. And the other catch too is because you're in that area to use any of the facilities or parking lots, you need to have the national park reserve pass so we bought the pacific rim national park reserve pass which was also 
an additional $50 per person. But we were going to spend three nights there and we did explore a variety of areas around there. And if we added each day's trip up with daily passes, it would have been less or more. So we just opted for the Pacific Rim annual pass. So all together with three nights, it cost $99 for the campsite plus reservation, 110 plus hundred dollars. So it cost 210 for two people for three nights, four days exploring the area. So it definitely is not cheap to stay there, but there's really nowhere else to stay there. So you have very few options along that side. South of there towards our last few days, we stayed at the Juan de Fuca campground at China Beach. There, the campsites are $20 per night, but if you do online reservation, it costs $6 per night of reservation online, up to $18. So we were there four nights. So reservation costs would be six times, well, $18 max, but $18. And then four nights times 20, $80 for campsites. The campsites were really nice. Uh, there were no showers there at that one. But $80 plus $18, $98 altogether for four nights. Quite a bit. Uh, still less than staying at a hotel, but it's still uh, quite a bit. It really offset being at recreation sites that were free just for that. So beware when you're exploring the southern half, you're going to have to pay for campsites. So get ready for that. So during one of my videos, I did mention the West Coast Trail that actually goes through the Pacific Rim National Park Preserve. It's about 46 miles, but it usually takes six days to do. You don't have to choose your campsites along the way, but I guess it takes six days. You have to work with the tides because sometimes you can't go certain places if the tide's in and if it's a high tide. Uh, so it takes longer and there is a lot of up and down uh, climbing over roots and up the cliffs, ladders, and all kinds of things. And I guess there's even like a cable slide thing. And uh, it takes a long while. But the reason we did, didn't do that at all is just because of the cost. The reservation fee was $24 and the overnight use permit was $127 per person. And you also need to get ferry to the beginning. And there is a ferry in the middle where you have to cross the river so all those together are $40. So all together, it cost $192 per person to hike the West Coast Trail. Now I did use the word rip off in the video, but I only say that because, yeah, there's a but. This was right after we hiked Mount Rainier, which is about a 96 mile backpacking trip around Mount Rainier. And that was a grand total of zero dollars. <laughs> there is no fee to reserve. There's no, well, if you do it online, there's a $20 when the lottery occurs. But if you do a walk up, it's free. And each night is free. The whole thing is free. You have to buy your own food and cash some food. But other than that, it's free. So it was a huge difference. And before that, my other long trip was a PCT, which is a Pacific Crest Trail. And that was free for all the permits to hike the whole thing. This is of course, transportation and food in there, but um, still you can hike the entire PCT for less fees than the West Coast Trail, which would be about 150 Canadian dollars or about a hundred dollars US per person. So that's why we didn't do it. It was just too expensive and we would rather have spent some of that time in a nice hotel every now and then because it was raining so much and we didn't we only have a limited amount of time there and we didn't want to spend six days of that on there as well. I guess the other point too though is that even if we wanted to, there is still such a high demand for that trail that we probably wouldn't have been able to get a permit. So this atlas is the eighth edition. The copyright inside says 2017, so I'm pretty sure that 2017 is for this edition. So already it's gonna be three years old 
And by the time I get there, it's going to be quite outdated and the roads won't be as reliable as I would want. So if you made it this far into this video, I have to believe that you're interested in going to Vancouver Island and exploring everything as well. So if you would like this book and that other folding map, I will send it to you uh, within the United States because just because the postal postage is cheaper. Just give me a comment below. If there's a lot of people that comment, I'll, I'll randomly pick. Um, I say we give it until next week, Friday, to have everyone comment if they want. So next week, Friday, by the end of the day, comment if you want a copy of this. I'll just mail it to you for free with the United States. You don't have to pay anything. And I will also uh, try to sanitize it a little <laughs> as, I, as best I can, and I'll put it in a big Ziploc Although it's pretty big, I guess it won't fit in a Ziploc bag. But I will send it to you. Um, just leave a comment below. Just tell me what, um, if you want it. It's super useful. Again, it's about $20 US. So, I mean, it's not expensive, but it's not cheap either, especially if you're just using it for a few weeks. But we use it quite a bit, so I highly recommend it. So if you're going to go, either get one or just comment below and then uh, you can get this one. I'm not sure if they're going to make a ninth edition or when. So maybe this will still be the newest one this year or next year. Who knows? But it's, it's, it's useful. So um, yeah, just comment below. Well, that's it, everyone. That's all I have right now. There may be more things I think of after I finish editing the video. <laughs> but if you liked this video, please subscribe and like this video. And I will put out more information later for now i am still at my sister's place at her in her basement i don't know if you could see like lots of toys over there <laughs> i kind of dimmed the lights so not everything is as visible but uh hopefully within the next few weeks i'll get back on the road and uh maybe with a kayak who knows and i'll talk to you later bye